Okay, um, well hello, my name is Jody Provost and I'm with the Minnesota Chapter of the Wildlife Society and I have the pleasure today of interviewing George Davis um, here at his home in Deep Haven, Minnesota. Um, George was a wildlife manager for many years at Carlstead and I was blessed to get to work with him for seven years and so it's a real honor today to get to visit with George and to interview him. I guess we could start out, um, George, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up. and I was born in uh, Marshall, Minnesota in 1940. Uh, my parents were George Davis Sr., so I was always called Junior, and my mother was name was Lena. And we always had the Norwegian jokes, of course, but she was French, and I understand the name comes from that. I grew up in a family of six. I had two older brothers, two younger brothers, and an older sister. Uh, Marshall was a good place to grow up at that time, population around 6,000, and it had many opportunities to see wildlife and uh, other recreational opportunities and also uh, to pick up good habits as far as work went. Uh, there was much, not much else about Marshall except my dad grew up on a farm by Lind and we used to spend a lot of time in what we called the woods down along the Redwood River uh, southwest of Lynn, Minnesota, and uh, we took advantage of the natural resources that were there, like picking asparagus and quite a bit of hunting and bullhead fishing, which was <laughs> common in that area. Done. Okay, and then, um, so can you tell us a little bit briefly about your education? I graduated from a small Catholic school in Marshall and we were blessed with a very poor science program. Uh, other than that we had a good school but when I went on to college at St. John's University I was in pre-engineering and was at a great disadvantage because I did not have a background in math or in chemistry or science. So I struggled there. I went two years uh, with their program and transferred to the University of Minnesota. And I had immense problems with the math there because our Chinese teachers, if you want to call them that, were very difficult to understand and not very helpful in classes. So after two semesters, I decided to quit, figure out what I was going to do, and go to work. I worked for several years as a uh, carpenter's aide, uh, building houses from the basement all the way through finishing them. And then I worked for a contractor laying sewer and water main. And I did that for several years until we worked ourselves out of a job. job was supposed to last until August, and we were out of work in June. Uh, we, we worked too fast. <laughs> uh, after that, I quit and went to work at a lumber yard, hauling lumber, and at that time I got a notice from the draft board that the Army wanted me. I did not want the Army, so I joined the Navy. At that time uh, I still was not sure what I wanted to do, but I was thinking of being a teacher and was going to complete school at that point. I. Uh, did not know anything about wildlife management and did not have any uh, contact with any DNR people at that time. 
uh, I graduated from the University of Minnesota in uh, 1967. <laughs> And that was nine years after I had graduated from high school. I think that's it for okay. education. Did you um, have any pivotal moment that you know was an inspiration as to what made you decide, you know, I really want to be a wildlife manager? Uh, when I was home on leave the first year, uh, the first fall that I was in the Navy, I uh, encountered two wildlife managers down in the Marshall area that uh, needed a pull out of a ditch. <laughs> so the hunting buddy and I pulled them out and we visited a short period of time. Mm -hmm. That was my first inclination that maybe, hey, that's a job I think I should look into. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I got the information from the University of Minnesota and decided I'm going to go back to school to be a wildlife manager. And do you remember who those managers were by chance? I don't remember what okay. their names were. The <laughs> one ended up uh, being a uh, real estate uh, uh, manager a short period after we had met him. Okay. That's all I, I know about him. Okay. And along the way, um, do you have any particular mentors that stand out of mind that really influenced you? I didn't have any uh, any mentors or any other people influenced me on on my job. Uh, the closest I came to a mentor was probably my guide in uh, school who was a fisheries professor and he was not really very helpful in guiding me in the wildlife field. Okay. Uh, I generally had to figure out all my classes and schedules because I finished up the wildlife curriculum in two and a half years. And the last two years were all the biology, not biologies, but uh, ornithology, ichthyology, so forth. Mm -hmm. I had two years uh, with all that crammed in. Wow. And plus the fact I was married and working at the time at least 20 hours a week. Wow. Okay. Um, what part of your formal education would you say was most useful in your career? I think the background I had in the uh, sciences, particularly math, uh, helped me in a lot of wise decisions on what could be done. You did not go into trying to do a project when you figured out the cost was going to be worth more than the benefits were going to be. Mm -hmm. So I did not end up doing a lot of nonsense uh, requests for uh, jobs uh, to be done. Mm -hmm. And I also had a work ethic uh, from uh, prior, prior, prior jobs that wanted me to work uh, and to be honest and give the state a full value of my, my experience. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the hunting and fishing you did growing up was an influence? Oh, definitely the hunting and fishing I did uh, growing up. I spent a lot of time uh, outdoors uh, uh, doing butterfly collections and uh, fishing for minnows that we would use for northerns once in a while. Uh, bullhead fishing, ride the bike to the river, fish on Main Street, whole <laughs> works, we had fun. Cool, that's cool. <laughs> okay, and then... Um, do you want to share a little bit more about your military service and, and, and thank you for your service? I decided that when I was going to be drafted that I did not want to serve in the Army. So I contacted a recruiter in Wold Chamberlain here in Minneapolis about the possibilities of uh, joining the Navy 
and he told me they had a naval reserve where I did one active of one year of active reserve and two years of active service uh, was among three options that they had and I said I would do the two years and the one year and then of course the inactive reserve that requ was required. I uh, did my active reserve before I went into active duty so I never went to boot camp. I went directly into a receiving station and was sent to HU-4, it's a helicopter utility squadron out of Lakehurst, New Jersey. We were a service that provided services for non-aviation uh, support uh, aboard uh, ships that were not aircraft carriers. In other words, cruisers, destroyers, uh, oiler. I ended up serving most of my time, as much as I could anyway, uh, at temporary additional duty to get away from the uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey area and to see part of the world. I uh, saw a lot of eastern United States, southern United States, Caribbean Sea, and spent time in uh, the Mediterranean Sea aboard a uh, oiler, which is, it was a fuel ship. Uh, we did search and rescue if it was required, and uh, transporter personnel, and also goods from ship to ship. Uh, it was great duty to be TAD, except for when I was assigned to an aircraft carrier that was turned into a communi communication ship in Virginia Beach, which was a punishment for not re-enlisting. Uh, after that, I got out with an <coughs> honorable discharge and returned home and entered school. Okay. And where again did you say you went to college? Or University of Minnesota. Okay. I got my degree from the University of Minnesota in the spring of 97. Okay. No, 67, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> You look good, really good for your age. <laughs> um, okay, so describe your first professional position then and how you got the job. My first positional description was in Carlstead, Minnesota. I had not received any inquiries from anybody from Minnesota and was curious so I went in after six months to find out what was going on and I was told I was on the fisheries list and I said I did not want the fisheries list I wanted to be on the list of wildlife management. Shortly after that I was called into the wildlife office and offered the Carlstead position. Uh, I said I'd take it. I was anxious to be a wildlife manager. Uh, Minnesota would not have been my first choice, but it was the only offer I had. Uh, plus the fact I had to look at a map to find out where Carlstead, <laughs> Minnesota was. I had no idea what northwestern Minnesota was like. I did not even know they had moose in Minnesota <laughs> at that particular time. I was to find out shortly mm -hmm. after that that they had a lot of different wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so how many years were you at Carlstead then? I ended up in Carlstead and retired in 1999. I spent my entire career in Carlstead, mm -hmm. primarily because the positions I wanted were not offered or unavailable. I interviewed for two positions, one for Thief Lake and one for Bemidji, and I was competing against a 
mentor that I had uh, from day one in Karlstad and felt he was better qualified for the job. So I <laughs> did not get him. The last one, uh, the regional manager's job in Bemidji, I was asked if I would take the job if it was offered, and I said no, because my wife had just finished school and was offered a job as a teacher. My children were too old. They were in high school and did not want to transfer. So I ended up at that point deciding, I guess I'm here for the rest of my career. <laughs> So, yeah, that probably does not happen very often that one person has one DNR job, the same position, their entire career in the same place. That's pretty unique. It's pretty unique, yeah. and I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> well, having worked up at Carlson with you for seven years as assistant, I know what a beautiful landscape it is up there. Could, would you like to tell us a little bit about some of your duties up there? When I first went up, my first duty was introduction to land acquisition. I was assigned doing project maps for two large wildlife management areas, the Beaches Lake and the Caribou Wildlife Management Areas at the same time. Caribou was somewhere around 18,000 acres and Beaches Lake was close to 40,000 acres. I had to draw the acquisition maps, property, so forth. So I had my first introduction to wildlife acquisition. Robert Farms was my supervisor out of Thief River Falls. He had a dynasty at that time, included all of Northwest Minnesota from Detroit Lakes all the way up to the border. In other words, they created the uh, Crookston job, the Detroit Lakes position, and the Carlstead positions out of his area, out of Thief River Falls. Uh, when I was first introduced to land acquisition, we were able to do our own uh, acquisition. We did the appraisals. We did the negotiating. We signed the options to purchase land. Uh, appraisal amounted to about six sheets of paper, which was pleasant at that time. <laughs> the last acquisition I did the appraisal on for the Bureau of Land Management was 120 some pages to uh, do the appraisal. Things did not get easier through <laughs> land acquisition. We had good uh, rapport with the county board at that time and were able to purchase whenever we had a willing, willing seller. When I started in uh, Carlstead, there were five wildlife management areas with about 25,000 acres. When I left Carlstead, there were over 20 wildlife management areas and approximately 100,000 acres. A lot of it had been purchased from private areas. I think it was over 50,000 acres. The rest was trust fund land that we acquired uh, administrative control over. Uh, another primary area was trying to do prairie management. Uh, Carl's Kitson County had the bulk of the Aspen Parkland that was still left intact in Minnesota. The only Aspen Parkland that existed had been in the several counties in northwest Minnesota and in Manitoba up into parts of Saskatchewan. Uh, other than that, there was never, never any other areas of Aspen Parkland anywhere as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Aspen Parkland was a 
mosaic of brush, marsh, aspen woods, and prairie. Uh, it was a beautiful area, especially the mosaic pattern of it. It supported lots of wildlife, and it was a very interesting area, especially when you had the Red River Valley 15 miles to the west, which was prime agricultural land, and you had what people called wasteland east of that. That wasteland was a wildlife management country. Uh, we had quite a bit of uh, marsh, and we had excellent waterfall habitat, uh, and we developed several large, or several large uh, impoundments had been created prior to my arriving. Uh, they were in construction phase at that time. Okay. You were very instrumental in creating those large WMAs up there like Beaches, Skull Lake, Caribou, Twin Lakes, East Park, Florian, what am I missing, Devil's Lake, Alma Swamp, Joe River, it's a littler one up there. Um, Skull Lake. Skull Lake, yep. <coughs> Hunt, Huntley, yep. Um, I know just personally, and also I have a lot of colleagues and friends that are really grateful for having those areas that you help create for us to manage for Minnesotans, but also so we love hunting on them ourselves. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, so in your decades up there, what were some of the changes that you've observed over time from the, from the beginning to when you retired that really stand out? Uh, I mentioned something about land acquisition. When we started, land acquisition was simple. The land, the wildlife managers were very involved in it. Uh, we selected the areas to submit as proposed wildlife management areas and once they were approved we could start purchasing the land. The wildlife managers were instrumental in purchasing the land. We got, quote, help when they created the land bureau and they were going to help us and do the land acquisition for us. At that time, things started to turn sour. Uh, the six-page appraisal uh, changed to be a big uh, task. Uh, some of us were allowed to do the appraisals yet, otherwise they took over the whole process. We could get it done because it was a priority for us. For them, it was a job and it was not as efficient. Mm -hmm. And we started to run into opposition from people that felt DNR had too much land and the county boards balked at giving us permission to purchase. So we were free to purchase land in the early, early days of my career and by the time I quit, it was almost impossible to get county board I personally did the appraisal and <clears throat> negotiated a purchase of somewhere around 4,500 acres at one time. My first acquisition was two square miles up in the Caribou unit and it was our first venture into grazing for prairie management. I'll talk more about the prairie grazing management later. Okay. And were there any partners that were instrumental in getting some of that work done? Jerry Martins uh, and Bob Farms both helped me. Bob Farms was the uh, mentor, of course, out of Thief River Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I was pretty well allowed to work alone. Mm -hmm. I was the first manager in Carlstead. There had never been one before, um, so I had a lot of mm -hmm. uh, establishment to do. 
as far as getting to know people and so forth. Okay. How about, I, I'm kind of thinking like um, of the Nature Conservancy. They, they had a, a hand in, in helping, didn't they? Uh, Nature Conservancy came in uh, in the latter parts of my <coughs> career after the county boards balked at us purchasing any more land and it was they became involved when a West German had purchased a large truck of tract of what had been former uh, Great Northern Railroad land. And when he purchased it, he did not get along with the local residents or with the county boards and was trying to farm in a European way and ran into problems. We tried to purchase from him. We could not do it. At that point, the uh, Nature Conservancy bought all of the remaining tracks that were not uh, acquired at that time. So the Nature Conservancy ended up with uh, several thousand acres outside the wildlife management area and a whole bunch of it in the uh, caribou unit. So we had joint manager, management of caribou and uh, some of the joint areas. And that, that would be Dieter Grunig, right? Dieter Grunig. <laughs> he was a character. <laughs> yes, he was a character. I had several deals with him to uh, exchange land, but he backed out of every one of them after okay. he had, we had made a deal. He liked to ditch, didn't he, if I remember yes, right? He yes, he liked to ditch. <laughs> uh, well, I just can't help but mention, you know, some of the things that changed over time. Do you remember when our computer showed up at the office? And I remember it sitting in a box, and neither of us really wanted to open that thing up and use it. <laughs> and then when we got email, I remember neither of us really wanted to check that thing called email either. <laughs> I think that was the worst thing that happened to Charles did, <laughs> is getting that computer. <laughs> and uh, for the map on the wall, I mean, that, that was our GIS. We had a photocopies from plat pages taped together on the wall and we would use colored pencils right and mark in the state lands and the projects and, and that was the map right yep. yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. well um, what would you say um, was maybe your most humorous experience up there can you think of a funny story that stands out it's a series of funny stories the State required registration of moose. And to start with, they wanted to examine some parts. And my office was on Main Street of Karlstad, who was, thank goodness, a wide street. And we registered moose. They had to bring in their parts, hearts, lungs, uterus, testicles, and I don't know what else. Into that office on Main Street, we had to collect them, examine them, and dispose of them. We would ask all these people, do you want any of it? No way. <laughs> so we'd end up with a pickup load that we had to dispose of or so. But the commotion and the excitement of the people in Carlstead and the hunters was a circus. It was very entertaining uh, what you ended up with. You ended up with a, four, a small car, Ford Fiesta or whatever it was, with four people in it, all their gear, and a calf moose stuffed in the trunk. <laughs> or you would get a camper coming in with the moose up on top. I don't know how they got it off. I imagine they had a loader getting on. But it was a hilarious situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember one of the highlights working up there with you was right when there was still a huntable moose population, Les Cuba harvesting a moose with his hunting party. That was a commotion in town, too. I remember over at the gas station yes. there by the yes. stoplight. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, and mentioning moose, I mean, we should probably talk about a little bit. You were fortunate to work there when there was still a healthy moose population. And then we actually witnessed the decline very rapidly. Do you want to share about that at all? Moose seasons, I think, started in 1971. Uh, the department had been pushing for a moose season for 10, 20 years prior to that. Uh, we were not, the department was not doing census and survey uh, for moose west of Highway 89 or Roseau. Basically, they did it in the Norris Camp area. And after I started flying moose census, we, I maybe, influenced them to expand the moose harvest out to where the moose were in uh, Kitson County, Western, Roseau, and Marshall County. It was not long, about 10 years, we had the bulk of our moose populations in the area that would, had never been census before. Uh, part of the reason was frequent wildfires that burned large tracts. We had young young willow and young brush and there were areas where we would count 50 to 60 moose within a 15 square mile area. Uh, other areas of course with poor habitat had less. Uh, we probably harvested somewhere around two or three percent of the moose when we had a season. And I don't know if we could even call it a hunt, but the hunter sure enjoyed shooting a, a moose out of somebody's pasture or from the road. Uh, most of them were taken that way. Uh, we had ticks from the beginning. We had liver flukes from when we were uh, we had the brain worm, and we could not figure out what the main cause was for the decline. We were losing a lot of the younger animals, the yearlings, the two and a half year old, were dying, and we could best we could come up with was no, they had pneumonia, but we don't know what the cause was. They started to do a research project, when they got done with it, they still did not know what the uh, problem was. We discontinued the census within about four years of when the crash uh, started. We were counting anywhere from or an estimate of seven, 8,000 moose down to about 2,000 in four years. Uh, and we had quit quit the uh, moose season by that time. Uh, my personal feeling, it was a combination of all the vectors that had built up and they were in the environment and it caused the crash. Uh, I don't have anything to base that on. Plus, I believe moose populations are cyclic on a long-term cycle. I'll never see that but it would not surprise me if we have moose again in about 30 years. There are a few hanging on, I believe, in the Agassiz Wildlife Management Area, but other than that, they are completely gone in Minnesota. There are some still in North Dakota where they could come in. They might come back just like the elk did. Okay. Um, so you talked about the circus of the, the moose registration and that being humorous, how about, can you think of a situation um, that was most frightening, something that happened during your career? Two things. Uh, I had never had much exposure to explosions. I had seen somebody light uh, a couple sticks off to break up some concrete uh, bridge pilings when I was working uh, construction. Uh, I had a beaver dam that was causing some major problems. I got some dynamite, some caps, some fuse, 
from Thief Lake. And when I let that fuse, I was very nervous. Nothing happened other than the dam got blown. I did not get hit by the debris. <laughs> and after that, it wasn't as bad. But my worst experience was a wildfire on East Park Wildlife Management Area. I had a report that the fire was out there. I wanted to go investigate, see what was going on. I took two of my children with me. And we were out. There was a farm tucked back into the woods on the south part of East Park. And I drove in there. The people were home. There were a half a dozen of them there panicking. And they said, what can we do? And I said, the only thing you can possibly do is to try to backfire around your buildings and hope that the fire will skip you. We got them started. I left and I got back to the main road and was going to go south. I turned and we hit the main part of the blaze. I had to drive through that close to a mile with flames going over the road and stuff. I don't know how we made it, but we made it out. I never drove into another fire like that again. Oh my gosh. Um, in your years up there, what would you say some of your most useful and needed management tools were? I think the when I started my first acquisition, when the people that were pasturing the uh, property wanted to know if they could continue a pasture, at that time we did not have a policy of allowing cattle on a wildlife management area. I got permission to do a grazing permit and from there we end up uh, with acquisition of more land in control, establishing grazing units covering about uh, seven square miles, which was excellent sharp tailed grouse and rough grouse habitat. Uh, geese and sandhill cranes loved the area after it was grazed, but the grazing was rotational grazing and very light. And we had several other uh, pastures uh, in the in the area uh, on uh, uh, the Beaches Lake Wildlife Management Area. My only thing is that, that bothers me is I did not push for more grazing in some of the other units. We had pasture units on the peeling, peeling unit and that was established primarily because of trespass and I got irritated with the people that were trespassing on the state land and I made arrangements to buy the land from the Nadrick, which was former uh, railroad land and we ended up with a pasture unit. Okay. And my favorite one was burning. We started out burning dragging a rag soaked in oil, uh, wrapped around a piece of wire, and hoping the fire would stop. We had backpacks. That was our equipment. Uh, we didn't do much burning, but we did. We were able to uh, contain it. Uh, I went to the wildlife schools, or the forestry schools, for burning. Was qualified to burn large areas. We got equipment and we could start burning a section, two sections at a time, and start managing our own burning career. Uh, the largest burn I was ever managed, managed was somewhere around 4,000 acres in the Caribou unit. And that was the year after I left on a contract basis. But uh, we burned, tried to burn every two or three years. And the other, another uh, thing that was very positive in my mind was the uh, prairie grass production. I was approached by a person interested in prairie grass seed, wanted to know if he could harvest drop seed 
little blue stem and big blue stem from the Skull Lake and Caribou units. I said the only way we can do it is to get a cooperative farming agreement and get a fourth of the crop. We started, we uh, planted some on Twin Lakes, uh, about 56 acres. We would burn that every year. He would harvest it for us, give us the fourth of the seed. One year we ended up with about 11, 1,200 pounds of seed valued at 14 to 15 dollars a pound. That was not allowed under cooperative farming agreements. St. Paul did not know it. I probably shouldn't <laughs> say that. But you can't get fired now. <laughs> but uh, years after I, I uh, left Carlstad, I found out that our prairie grass seed uh, patch that had been so productive was planted to soybeans oh. by DNR. Oh. Somebody claimed that there was Parks Bluegrass intermixed with the seed, which Parks Bluegrass is a cultivar. And the original source came from Skull Lake and Carol. So I was very upset about that. Yeah, that's too bad. No names. And the, the, the gentleman who harvested seed was Oscar Carlson, right? That's correct. Yes. He also was a very unique fellow, hard worker, just loved his prairie, didn't he? And, and now Mike and Tara Ratzlaff took over that company several years ago from Oscar and are still operating it. Yes. 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 It's very neat. Okay. Um, okay, let's move to your family now. Um, just a little bit about them and them growing up there and how your work up there impacted them. My wife and I started going together when uh, we were in high school in about 1957. Uh, uh, we went together for about four years, and we were forced to separate uh, for a period of time. Uh, I was in the service when she became available again, and uh, we got married in 1965. Had four children, one son and three daughters. They were forced to live in a small community of around 750 people. They had few opportunities for work, and they had a small school to go with, go to, that had limited opportunities for a curriculum. They had a math program that was terrible. So when they went off to school, they were ill-equipped, just like I was in the sciences. Uh, they uh, had to put up with a small community and had limited uh, opportunities to do things, but they made the most of it and uh, they learned to appreciate the wild things. Most of them do a lot of camping and they all married uh, hunters and outdoor people uh, and did very well. Uh, they all graduated from college. Uh, two of them have doctorate degrees. One has a master, master's degree. The other one just kind of left with a bachelor's degree. But they all did well. They're married, have children, and they're very productive citizens. I think uh, they learned uh, a lot by living in a small town and by the fact that I was dedicated to my business, my work, and that that was the norm, that's what they should do. Mm -hmm. And just having been up there with you, I know your family was very integrated in the community, I know an important part of it, um, you know, just the fact that 
the coffee, rolling dice for coffee, those conversations and those friendships and relationships, um, I think they made everything easier. Didn't want to come to work too. People knew you as a person in addition to a DNR person, right? I think that's one of the important things that wildlife managers should do. Mm -hmm. They should live in the proximity of their work area. They should not be outside the work area and they should get involved with the community and get the people to know them, to trust them. Mm -hmm. I was elected to the city council on a write-in vote uh, just a few years after I had uh, moved to Carlstad. The city clerk was having an absolute fit because somebody from DNR was going to be on the city council. He confessed to me years later that that was one of the better things that happened to the city council and so forth. And I think it was a very important thing also for the community that I was not an outsider. I was not against them. Mm -hmm. And they, the people, the general people in, in Kitson County trusted me and part of that went for from our contact with them in uh, Lions, other uh, activities that we were in, plus the contact we had when we did uh, bag checks, especially the Sharp Tail Cross bag check. Mm -hmm. That was before they all built cabins and quit coming through the area. Yeah, that's, that's noteworthy. Carlshood was the last place to have sharp tail grouse bag checks. And we tried boxes for a while. We were the last place to have those too. I, I wanted to quit, but Jody wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was too fun. <laughs> Everybody else wanted me to do it, yes. but they quit. <laughs> and when you were also involved in your local church community. I remember going to Waterfall Association banquets, deer hunters banquets, Ducks Unlimited banquets, I mean... I was involved in a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I was the project coordinator for building a new church in Carlstead. Mm -hmm. So, kind of wrapping up on the reflections part of the profession, one of the questions here is, what do you think makes a great wildlife manager? And obviously one of them you just mentioned is being involved in their, your community. What else do you think makes a good wildlife manager? I think you have to get out and know your area. Uh, a knowledge and an understanding of what what uh, is there. And know the people and get them to cooperate with you. Uh, people have to trust you, know you, and that's living with them. Whereas you're an outsider if you come from Thief River Falls to work in, in Carlston. Uh, I see they finally have a CO in Carlstead now, first one in Kitson County for, oh, 20 some years. The uh, COs were from outside the uh, county. Uh, yep, sorry, that was off the subject. <laughs> but I've got that somewhere. Yeah, it's hard to keep conservation officers up there. Oh, a lot of it goes to, goes to a work ethic, and you have to have common sense uh, on what will work. Uh, you have to try and do projects and get get things done that can be done without too much uh, adverse uh, reactions. You have to communicate with the locals. Sometimes they won't agree with you. I know I had problems with the county boards. And I had problems with the uh, county engineers and so forth. But you get things to work out, and you have to work with work with the local people. Is one of the important tools.
Mm-hmm. Okay. Why do you think someone today should be considered becoming a wildlife professional? If you want a frustrating job, <laughs> be a wildlife management area. But it's very rewarding. It's very, very good. You work with a lot of great people. And it's a great experience to be outdoors. Okay. And what gives you hope for the future of our wildlife conservation, you know, our, these jobs and this career and the habitats as a whole? What gives you hope? That's a hard question. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think we're going to get a change in the political atmosphere. Uh, back then, politics was against uh, wildlife habitat, DNR, uh, local politicians campaign using DNR as a whipping boy if they were going to change things. Uh, I don't think that'll change. But I, I think that we have enough uh, cooperation and help from all the wildlife organizations and the people, and they are going to be the pushing force, force to uh, help wildlife managers do their job. We have to have <laughs> science involved in managing wildlife and not crazy ideas that politicians come up with. Amen to that, science and partners, and our young people. All right, um, I guess, is there anything in closing that you'd really want to share that we missed? No, I think that pretty well covers it, everything. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you very much um, for everything you've done for wildlife conservation in the Carlson work area, and also just personally, you were an important mentor to me. And um, I want to point out too, the picture over George's shoulder there is a really neat watercolor by Ross Heyer of the Aspen Parklands up there with magpie and sandhill cranes. Um, and with that, We'll go ahead and uh, say goodbye. Thank you very much, George. Thank you.